For this derivation, we center our circle at the origin of an ij coordinate system. Let's consider the, the position vector of the particle at a particular time. For simplicity, we will suppose that at t equals zero, the particle was here. And at some time t later, the particle is here. Since the particle moves with uniform or constant speed, the angular velocity is constant. And we saw in a previous video that the angular velocity um, is om omega. And since omega is theta divided by t, theta is omega multiplied by t. So we multiply the angular speed by the time and we get the angle swept out over that time t. We can resolve vector r into its horizontal and vertical components. To get the horizontal component, we multiply the magnitude of vector r, which is just r without the arrow, by the cos of angle theta. Now, theta is measured anti-clockwise from the positive x-axis. So if we multiply r by cos of omega t, that's what theta is, we will actually have the i component of the vector. Okay, if we follow that convention of measuring our angle anti-clockwise from the positive x-axis. So when theta is an acute angle, an angle between 0 and 90 degrees, the cos of omega t will be positive, and all of this quantity will be positive. If theta is obtuse, that is, it lies between 90 and 180, the cos of omega t will be negative. So the i component will come out to be negative, and so on for angles in the other quadrants similarly for the j component. Now we can get the velocity vector v by differentiating the position vector r with respect to time. Now I will try to give you um, a rough intuition for why that's true. Okay, so we know that velocity is change in position divided by the, the time taken for that position to occur. Sorry, the time taken for that change to occur. So if we imagine this particle moves a very tiny distance to here, then the new position vector looks like this. The change in the position vector will look like this. So what we're doing here is very like what you saw for the derivation of the centripetal acceleration using a geometrical approach. Um, but we're not talking about the change in the velocity vector here. We're just talking about the change in the position vector. So the change would actually be this vector here. And uh, you can see already that this change is tangential to the circle, at least in the limit as we let this angle go to zero. This angle would be delta theta. That's just a change in angle theta. So the direction of the velocity vector is the same as the direction of the change in the position vector. Okay, so we did something like that. Well, except we we're, we're talking about the velocity vector in a previous video. Now, for the first time, we are differentiating a vector quantity. And what I'm about to do is can be proven to work, but I'll just go ahead and do it. We can just differentiate each of these with respect to time. So to get the i component of the velocity vector, we need to differentiate this quantity here with respect to time. Now the derivative of the cos function is minus sine. Now the r sits in front, so I just write down sine omega t here. And by the chain rule, we need to differentiate the angle. Now the angle is just a constant times time. Omega is a constant. So if we differentiate a constant times t with respect to t, we just get that constant. It's just a number. So we get omega here. So that's just applying the chain rule to the derivative of r cos omega t. r and omega are constants. r is just the radius of the circle. Omega is the angular speed. Next, we differentiate this term here. So if we differentiate the sine function, we get cos. But by the chain rule, we differentiate the angle. So like before, when we do that, we get an omega, and we multiply by that. So we multiply the derivative of the sine function by the derivative of the angle. We can factorize r omega out of this vector 
and we get this here. Now this R omega should be familiar. This is what we saw in the very first video. This is the magnitude of the speed. Now I didn't give any justification for what I did here, differentiating each of these components. But I might just quickly um, give an overview of why this thing works. Um, you know, like, we just want the change in vector r. So we want vector r at some later time, say t plus delta t, minus vector r at the time t that we're interested in, this time here. So this, this is the change in the vector, and we divide by the time taken for the change to occur, which is, of course, delta t. So we can write the top here as delta r, the change in vector r over the time interval delta t. This would be the average velocity. Of course, we need to take the limit. We need to let delta t go to zero. So this average velocity becomes the instantaneous velocity at time t. But if you try to write this thing out, you just replace t with delta t up here and here, of course. And then you have to subtract r of t. Well, that's just this thing here. Um, so you will see that when you gather up the vectors, you know, when we're calculating this difference, we're just getting the difference of the i components. So we'd have r cos omega of t plus delta t minus r cos omega of t. That's the i component. And as for the j component, we would have r sine omega of t plus delta t minus r sine omega of t. So we can put the i components together, the j components together, and we will just have the definition of derivatives for the i components and i and j components. So that's why we're allowed to differentiate these separately. But this is not like ordinary differentiation because normally on top we don't have a vector quantity. See, this is a vector quantity on top. Underneath we just have a scalar quantity, delta t, the time. Okay, so we have found vector v. Let's consider its magnitude. Well, we have to get the magnitude of this vector. So how do we do that? Well, we use Pythagoras' theorem. We square both components and sum them. Um, well, if we're squaring r omega, we get r squared omega squared. If we square this, we get sine squared omega t. And of course, we're going to get another r squared omega squared. This time, we have cos squared omega t. And we have to take the square root so that's how we get the magnitude of a vector. Square both components, sum them. Um, r squared omega squared is common to both of these, so we can take it out. And we have the square root of r squared omega squared. Well, that's just r omega. Then we have sine squared omega plus cos squared omega. Well, that's just 1. Okay, that's the famous identity. Sine squared theta plus cos squared theta is 1. So we see that the magnitude of the velocity is r omega, just like we saw in the first video. I'd like to mention also that vector v is perpendicular to vector r. Um, I stated that in the first video without really proving it actually, although it's fairly evident because um, the object is, at any instant, the object is moving in a direction that's tangential to the circle. But we can also see it by considering the slope of both of these vectors, or the slope of a line that contains vector r and vector v. To get the slope of vector r, we just take the j component and put it over the i component, and the r's cancel out. So we get sine omega t over cos omega t. So that's how we get the slope of a line through any vector. Let's do the same for vector v. We get the j component, which is r omega cos omega t, and put it over the i component, which is minus r omega sine omega t. The r omegas will cancel. There's an r omega above and below here, but they cancel out. And notice what we get we get a fraction which is got by inverting this one here and changing the sign. So that tells us that the line through vector r is perpendicular to the line through vector v. Another way to see it is that if we multiply these two things together we will get minus 1. Now let's get the acceleration vector. Well, that's the rate of change of the velocity vector with respect to time. So if we, if we look to the video where we use the geometrical method to get this 
acceleration vector, you saw that we got the change in the velocity. Well, it was called delta v back then. And we divided by the time taken for the change in velocity to occur, which was delta t. Okay, we took a time t and a, a time t plus delta t later. And uh, we, um, you know, constructed a triangle and so on. And we got the difference of the velocity vectors. And uh, we took the limit as delta t approaches zero. Well, the limit as delta t approaches zero of delta v divided by delta t, which is what we got before, is just a definition of dv dt. So let's differentiate this here. Well, r omega is just a constant. It's just a number sitting in front of this thing here. So we leave it to one side. And we just step into the bracket here and we differentiate both components. So we differentiate minus sine omega t with respect to t. Well, if we differentiate the sine function, we get cos. And if we differentiate omega t with respect to t, we get omega. And we have to multiply this omega by minus cos omega t. So that's just a chain rule. The derivative of the sine function times the derivative of the angle. So I've written that constant omega in front. And next we must differentiate the j component. And our omega is already taken out. So if we differentiate the cos function, we get minus sine. And again, by the chain rule, if we differentiate omega t, we get, with respect to t, we get omega. We can factorize out minus omega, so we get minus omega squared out here. And inside, we have cos omega ti plus sine omega tj. So we found the acceleration vector. Now, let's compare this vector to vector r. Now, this is interesting. I could take this r inside the bracket. I'll just do it, just to make it clear, although it's probably fairly clear what you're going to get. We could take the r in here and in here. And what's this? Well, this is none other than vector r. So I'll just, I'll just reverse that just to make it easier to read. So the acceleration vector a is minus omega squared times the position vector r. So all of this thing here, r cos omega ti plus sine omega tj is, is just a position vector r. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that vector a is a scalar multiple of the position vector. So uh, the acceleration vector must lie on the same line as the position vector r. Furthermore, the scalar is negative. Now, how do we know that this is always negative? Well, omega squared is positive. Well, omega is actually positive, so it won't matter here about squaring it. But if you square anything, it's always positive. So minus omega squared must be negative, no matter what omega is. Um, so the acceleration vector a is a negative scalar multiple of the position vector r. So the acceleration vector must point in a direction that's opposite to vector r. So here it is. It, it's on the same line as vector r but points in the opposite direction, which means that it must point towards the center of the circle. And that's what we found in the previous video using the geometrical method. Now, we see straight away, of course, that vector A must be perpendicular to vector V, um, because a line joining the center of, of a circle to the point of contact of a tangent to the circle is perpendicular to that tangent. Vector V is, a tan is on a tangent line at this point. We can also show um, that vector A is perpendicular to vector V by doing something similar to what we did before, the way we showed that vector V was perpendicular to vector R by getting the slope of the two vectors. We could get the slope of vector A and vector V, and of course we will um, see that they're multiplicative inverses of each other. If we multiply the slopes together, we get minus one. Well, they're negative multiplicative inverses of each other. Um, anyway, let's look at the magnitude of vector A. We can just write A without an arrow. Well, we just square the i and j components. 
we square the i component, so the i component is all of this here. If we square that, we get omega to the 4 or squared cos squared omega t. And then we square the j component, and that's the j component is minus omega squared or sine omega t, so that's going to give us plus omega to the 4 or squared sine squared omega t. And like before, we can factorize out omega to the 4 r squared. Well, it was slightly different before, but you see what's going to happen. We're going to get the square root of omega to the 4 r squared. Well, that's omega squared times r. And then we have the square root of cos squared omega t plus sine squared omega t. Well, that's just the square root of 1, which is 1. So we found the magnitude of the acceleration vector. Notice that it's constant, because there's no t involved in this, because cos squared omega t plus sine squared omega t works out to be 1, no matter what t is. So it doesn't matter what the time is, it doesn't matter where the particle is on the circle, it's the magnitude of its acceleration is constant. Omega is, is the constant angular speed, r is the radius of the circle. So vector a changes only in direction. Its magnitude is constant. Okay, so we saw this formula before, and uh, we had a second formula from the fact that v, the speed, is r omega. We can write omega equals v over r, so we have v over r squared times r, so that gives us v squared over r, as we saw before. So we have two formulas for the magnitude of the acceleration. This acceleration is known as the centripetal acceleration. Centripetal means center seeking. So the particle seeks the center of the circle in a sense. Its acceleration is always directed towards the center of the circle. That's perfect.